My next guest is a longtime Republican strategist who's worked at the highest levels of that party, who just quit the GOP after almost 30 years over the president's immigration policy, specifically family separation. In an impassioned tweet storm last week, Steve Schmidt wrote, this independent voter will be aligned with the only party left in America that stands for what is right and decent and remains fidelitous to our republic, objective truth, the rule of law, and our allies. That party is the Democratic Party. Uh, and MSNBC contributor Steve Schmidt joins me right here. Great to have you here. Good to see you, Chris. Um, so first I want to talk about that. Uh, the, the kind of breaking point for you, uh, you know, you've been a never Trumper. That's been clear. <laughs> you, you have a, you know, there's, there's a group of people that I think have very strong views about this individual, this president, and his character. And then there's a question at which point that that, that becomes true about everyone in league with him. What was the breaking point? Well, I had the experience uh, on, on June the 5th, standing on Juneau Beach and spending time in the Canadian Cemetery. Uh, spending time at Pegasus Bridge, uh, where the British 6th Airborne leapt in, and understanding the value of the U.S.-led liberal global order that emerged from the aftermath of humanity's greatest tragedy, which killed 80 million people and left the world in ruins. That liberal global order is worth defending. This president is an autocrat. He is not a small d. Democrat. He doesn't believe in liberal democracy. And what we're seeing here every day are five behaviors. One, he incites fervor in a base through constant lying. Two, he scapegoats minority populations and he affixes blame for complex problems to them and them alone. Three, he alleges conspiracies that are hidden and nefarious and linked to those scapegoated populations. Four, he spreads a sense of victimizations among those fervent supporters. And five, he asserts the need to exert heretofore unprecedented power to protect his victim class from the conspiracies and the scapegoated populations. Through all of history, you understand totalitarianism. You understand how democracies fall. You will find those five behaviors. Now, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, I would argue, and you and I disagree on many, many things, but we are fidelitous to liberal democracy. That's true. Right? That government of the people, by the people, for the people must continue. And the Republican Party has abdicated. Conservatism has become synonymous with obedience to the leader, a leader who says, I am the law. I am above the law. I will define what truth is. Truth is what the leader says it is, not what we would have recognized months ago as objective truth. And so the Republican Party has become a threat to liberal democracy. And all over the world, we see a regression in Poland in Hungary, the rise of far-right ethno-nationalist parties. And the last time this happened, it unleashed a tragedy the likes of which the world has never seen. And I think there's a real lack of imagination in this country about how fragile these institutions are and about how dangerous a president is unprepared, as authoritarian, as ignorant as he, the damage that he would be able to cause. You know, I, that's incredibly well said. Um, and, and when I think about this, and I, you think about those behaviors, right, they, they seem so obvious, right? I mean, the way this is. And here you have today the court. I mean, this is what I found so fascinating about the court's mm-hmm. decision today. Because really, the, if, if Donald Trump wasn't Donald Trump and President Marco Rubio on day one hadn't said all those things and he puts in this ban, it almost certainly, it's not even a question, right? right? I mean, the question is, does what this guy has said and the bigotry he's espoused yeah. taint in a kind of, unfixable way constitutionally this ban we all know what it was about we all saw it happen in real time and it's remarkable to me that you have Gorsuch and Roberts who's someone that I think you worked on his confirmation right? I love the confirmation basically doing a kind of sophisticated judicial version of the Paul Ryan I didn't read the tweet yeah <laughs> right it's, because like we're they all read the paper they all know it's entered into the facts of the case like the the intent was perfectly clear this was a religious test. This was a religious ban. This was what he said it was. We should take him seriously when he says things. 
And so this is as un-American a policy as we have ever seen. We have freedom of religion in this country, and, and this is also true. This decision harms the national security of this country in a profound way. The forces of Islamic radicalism, of extremism, are real and dangerous, but the only force that can defeat it is moderate Islam. This was a gift to the extremists. This was a fulfillment of bin Laden's strategy, which was to precipitate a global conflict, a war of civilizations between the West right. and between Islam. We don't want to be at war with a billion Muslims all over the world in a 21st century crusade. And so the stigmatizing of good and decent people and the insult given to the Muslim soldiers who have served this country, who have sacrificed, it is appalling. It also, there's also a similarity here, it strikes me, of what's happening on the border and here, right? In both cases, you've got, the president talks about MS-13, he talks about ISIS, right? And those are two groups that are both genuinely evil. It, I, there's no, outside of people who are in MS-13 and people who are in ISIS, there's no real supporters of them, right? Then what he does policy-wise is people fleeing ISIS from Syria and people fleeing the murders of MS-13 from Guatemala trying to come to this country who are saying, like, I, yes, I, they're horrible. Please, those are the people that end up caught in the gears of his demonization of those groups. When you look at a regression from democracy to something less than, to, to an autocracy, but all through history, when you look at violations of civil liberties, they have always occurred through a prism of fear, Right? Fear is a contagion. Yep. It erodes democratic values and institutions, but always it's in the name of security that civil liberties are compromised. And that lesson has been learned through history. And here we are repeating it again. And the moral shame that comes from internment camps, and that's precisely what they are for toddlers and children who are stripped away, some of those children stripped away from breastfeeding mothers. It is a shame that will linger, a stench that will linger around this vile administration and, and my view for a century. Is there a, I mean, is, is there a political constituency of voters in the, in the country that feel the way you do? I really mean this. Like, I don't know if there is. I mean, there's Steve Schmitz, there's Nicole Wallace, there's Charlie Sykes. There are people that exist in the world, Brett Stevens and are there voters out there who look at what's happening who are saying, I'm a Republican and I just can't abide this? Like, I just don't know as an empirical matter if they exist. I think that there are acts of kindness and decency that take place every day in this country. And I, I think about the Las Vegas shooting where Johnny Smith, 33-year-old African-American, runs into a hail of gunfire and he saves 33 people's lives. He's running towards a group of school kids to save them and he's shot twice in the neck. And then a white cop runs into the gunfire to save Johnny Smith's life. That is also America. You know, the author Alex Haley had a saying. He said, find the good and praise it. Right. Nobody can yep. compete with Donald Trump in a vileness contest. He's the most vile. Nobody can compete with Donald Trump in a dishonesty contest because he's the most dishonest. We have to find the good and praise it in this country. Free market American capitalism is worth defending, in my view. Liberal democracy is worth defending. The U.S.-led liberal global order, despite all of its flaws, yeah. it has secured the peace. It has lifted billions of people on the planet out of abject poverty into something approaching prosperity over the last 73 years. All of this is worth defending. It was architected by giants, conceived by FDR, built by a plain-spoken man from Independence, Missouri, Harry Truman, stewarded from John Kennedy to Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama, and the departure from it by, by this president, his fetishizing autocrats and dictators from Erdogan to Putin to President Xi, it is disturbing. And our allies, the people in the world who we are connected to by shared history, by shared values, are rightly concerned. But I do believe that the American people 
don't want to live in Trumpistan. Yeah. They want to continue living in America. And this is a fundamental question in 2018. This is the most important midterm election in American history. Because if this is not repudiated in November, this country is going down a track of not just decline, but a fundamental change that will be very, very difficult to change the trajectory that we're on. Steve Schmidt, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you very Good much. Good to see you. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.